Good morning, welcome back. I'm happy to see so many of you who came on time. I hope you had a restful weekend, a relaxing break. This is week six, so in a week and a half, we're going into spring break. Of course, I know that this probably means that a lot of you will have a midterm next week, not in this class. So you can thank me later. <laughs> and on week six, what we, go, what we do, the plan for the week is the following. I will finally get to talk about the second textbook by Peter Burke, still with some collaborators, a social history of the media. And even though at this point, several of the chapters were listed, three of them in the past two weeks, I will focus my attention today on the introduction. And as usual, I've prepared a set of notes, as usual for any kind of reading that may appear to be too complex and where I'm afraid you might get distracted or confused by the number of names, dates, titles of books, whereas what you're supposed to be is not to memorize all those names, books, titles, just use them as instruments to focus your attention on the concepts, and that's where my notes and my summary of the notes and the chapter comes in, that's why I will spend more time on this particular chapter, the introduction, and less on printing in its context, which is, even for the average student, slightly more manageable. Although, I will also offer some hints about printing in its content and the media and the public sphere in early modern Europe. On Wednesday, we will have the last demo about Notion, about, sorry, Evernote, the second digital tool. And on Friday, the last series of videos about the user experience and um, the hands-on activity, and perhaps some discussion. Um, keep in mind that there is another digital assignment, the second of the semester. And altogether at this point, this would be the fourth out of five assignments. On Evernote, I introduced the specific requirements for this digital assignment last week, both on Wednesday and also on Friday. On Friday, I added the text of my instructions I've decided to change the deadline since I made the requirements slightly more complicated and convoluted. Because if you remember, the basics of this digital assignment is that you need to pick a video about the Evernote experience that should be at least four minutes long, should be as recent as 2020, not older than 2020. It could be just on Evernote, or it could be a comparison between Evernote and Notion. But after you've identified a video you would like to work with, before you do any work on that, you need to send me an email saying, can I use this as my video? Because we want to create a small wiki where every student will be responsible for a different video. I will tell you in my message when I answer whether the video is still available and then you can proceed. Because you can imagine that if you just put Evernote inside YouTube, inside the hit list, in, inside the list of hits of possible choices, most of you will find some of the same videos, okay? So far, I've only received five messages or messages about five videos. Actually, I received seven messages from students about those videos. Five uh, reserved that video for another two students. I had to write back and say, sorry, this video was already selected. Today, I will, as promised, create a page 
I will link it here in the instructions. On this page, I will list the videos, the titles of the videos that were already reserved with the first name and the initial of the last name of the student this video uh, is, is assigned to. So don't wait until the last moment. Even if you postpone the work on the video, pick the video, preempt a video, reserve a video for yourself to work later. On this video, you will be required to create an Evernote page so that you can showcase your familiarity with various formatting features of Evernote. And as you find in here, the page will have a short summary of the video, a short list of key quotes, and be selective, extract from the video really the most interesting, most relevant passages, the most memorable quotes. You may have a section about tips and tricks if that's appropriate for the kind of video that you have. Otherwise, it might be themes about uh, Evernote, about the philosophy of this tool, depending on what the focus of the video you selected is on. Analysis should be your reflection on the video itself, what you've learned or, or what you think, if it is a video about themes, ways to use Evernote, etc. Okay, so I've called it analysis but you can make it your own, this last concluding paragraph, depending both on the kind of video you've selected and the kind of reaction or reflections you can have to the video or you can bring to this particular page, okay? So I'll create a page, so I'll, I'll list the videos in alphabetical order, those that are picked already, but keep working on that. Finally, if you want to know what we're going to do later after Evernote, our next digital tool will be another professional tool, which is the closest to something that requires a little bit of coding and therefore the, le the least user friendly uh, for, for some of the users. It's a open source server-side software called DocuWiki with two Ks because Docu, even in document, you find the K because it was created by German Andreas Gore, supported by then, uh, once it gained some popularity, supported by a wide community of programmers in the development of the various versions. It's been around for more than 10 years. And you find it represented in hundreds of thousands of wikis online. For three weeks, we will work on DocuWiki. After that, that will take us to the ninth week of the semester. For the remainder of the semester, we'll do two things. One, focus on Wikipedia and the technical and cultural sides of Wikipedia. So we'll talk about MediaWiki without doing anything in, in terms of digital assignments or hands-on activities. And also, before the end of the semester, I will introduce a series of more advanced tools or alternative apps that are gaining some popularity to look at what else is out there, what trends can be seen in this kind of market for knowledge management. I have corrected all of the assignments. So the last one was Google Me This by uh, last night. I had corrected and left my comments and a grade in all of the assignments and altogether, everything I have received at this point of the three assignments, the one about your digital life, the one about the creation of a page in Notion to uh, showcase the formatting features and the organizing features in Notion, and the one about Google searches, all of the assignments I've received have been corrected if there were assignments missing, I sent out email messages, left comments uh, on the pages, or both, okay? So these are my notes. 
about the focal points, the most important points for the introduction of the second textbook by Burke about the social history of the media. And of course, it starts with attempting to define the media, but also providing a history of the various definitions and the various interpretations of what the media are. We talk a lot about the media in terms of the actual language, the actual label. We can trace it back to the 1920s. However, this is not when the media were invented or discovered, because the definition of medium is really hidden inside various disciplines, various intellectual subjects of the past. Even when you look at the long history of rhetoric, and rhetoric was initially the very uh, point of focus for an entire branch of philosophy. If you take ancient philosophy before Plato and Aristotle, if you take the pre-Socratic school of Greek philosophy, they were obsessed with language, rhetoric, with persuasion, which are all key elements of the culture of the media to this day. And then from then on, rhetoric was developed both in Greek and in Roman culture throughout the entire period of that civilization and then through the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, etc., etc. So even ancient rhetoric was dealing with the same kind of issues that the study of the media is involved with. Language, communication. Content, persuasion. Rhetoric is all about influence, right? How can you use language to influence what? For the pre-Socratic, for example, for Gorgias, I may have mentioned this example. It's a very famous and extraordinary example. Gorgias, who was a Sicilian philosopher, Greek by language and, and by ethnic group, he exemplified the power of rhetoric and the power of their intellectual school of philosophy by saying, I can talk to someone who needs to have a leg amputated. I can talk this person into accepting the operation and sustaining the operation, because of course, uh, operations such as amputations were done without anesthesia during the, um, the times of the past. And uh, of course, you, you need to uh, stay still, etc. cetera. And, and, and don't believe for a minute what you see in every other, uh, especially American movies of the past about the West, uh, people getting drunk before such an operation. Don't do that. That's very dangerous for the outcome of the operation. You don't want to get drunk. You'll numb the pain, but you will not be in control of your body, and the doctor will, con will, will need uh, that in order for the operation, the surgery, to be successful. Okay, so that was an example, an extreme example of influence. I can convince someone to be patient, to bear patiently during an amputation, the pain. And later on, rhetoric becomes one of the core subjects for jurisprudence, because through rhetoric, the lawyer will try to influence the outcome of a trial, right? So even that is about the pillars of communication and the media communication of contents and influence. However, there is a difference between the period that goes from Greek or Roman civilization through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance to the modern era from the 1700s on. That is to say that from the 18th century, during the period leading to the French Revolution and through the period of the French Revolution, there is more attention to the idea that there is a public opinion that needs to be influenced. That there is a social body 
of ideas that needs to be influenced. That it's not just members, separate members of society, but what you're really working on are the manipulation of the minds of those who receive ideas. And you do that through language, of course. You do that through communication. And in fact, political propaganda becomes an official function of government with Napoleon. Napoleon Bonaparte creates a bureau, creates a ministry for the control of public information and propaganda and for the control of the press, right, of the period. So you can say for the control of the media. And from that point on, there is no government that is able to ignore that aspect. And again, it's nothing entirely new. There is just a more comprehensive and more systematic approach to this. Because even if you look at the past, let's say you consider the state of Venice during the Renaissance. And I'm talking about Venice because Venice, although it was a small state, a regional state in Italy with some uh, uh, colonies throughout the Mediterranean to uh, uh, control their commercial traffic from Venice to Egypt uh, and, and uh, Palestine, those were their uh, geographic areas of economic interest. Venice created one of the first modern administrative states with modern kinds of agencies, with modern archives, with a network of diplomats, a network of spies. Uh, so it was at the vanguard in the creation of a modern administrative state. Even if you take something as old as Venice during the 1500s, you still find that they're trying in their own way to influence propaganda, for example, by paying an official historian of the state to write the official history of um, Venice. And first they have it written in Latin, then they decide it's important to have it in the vernacular to reach to more people. They purposely omit for those histories episodes that would affect the good image of Venice. So they don't talk about the fact that Venice would hire or entertain relationship negotiations with killers to have political opponents killed in Turkey, for example, etc. So there was always some attention to political propaganda, but now it's being done systematically. And then during the 20th century, you have the interesting idea of the masses, of this, this idea that societies, modern societies are made, are made of millions of people that can be made to act as one, as one body. That you can use the media to influence how a wider community will react or act together both when you look at the First World War and then at the popular or populist political movements of the 1920s and 30s, fascism in Italy, communism in the Soviet Union, Nazism in Germany, they all share this idea that people can come together and act as one, which involves, of course, the elimination of democracy. Democracy was seen by all these three regimes as an obstacle. Because why have all these discussions? Why even entertain the idea that different people in society should have different opinions, different approaches? This will only slow down the process of reform. And fascism comes out of the sentiment that people coming together as they had done during the war in Italy, making their effort, forgetting about their differences, can achieve greater results, right? And therefore, you have these uh, big uh, parades, big events involving hundreds of thousands of people coming together, chanting together, wearing the same uniforms, etc. And you have this process of massification of society, which is quite different. 
And even when you look at newspapers, there is a big change. Of course, the newspapers, even in the 19th century, were giving news and op-eds, opinion pieces, right? And they were trying to influence their readers. But the approach was trying to influence the mind of each reader through content and style, through formatting, through illustrations and photographs, etc. And now newspapers during the 20th century start introducing a different element whereby you're not reading just about the news, which may influence your mind as a reader. You're reading about public opinion in society. You're reading about what other people in society think about an event or a political decision or a reform. And then you, as a reader, have this option. Do I want to be with the people I'm reading about? Do I want to be, uh, take an alternative position? You become aware that the act of reading and reacting to what you read places you in a group. And so you're being educated and influenced at a deeper level because you're being confronted with positions that should be followed and positions that should be avoided within the readership. You're not just isolated in your act of reading. You become aware that you're part of a generalized process of reading, reacting, and then supporting or opposing the ideas you're being exposed. It's no surprise that it is during the start of the 20th century that journalism becomes an academic subject with its own school of journalism. The first one is uh, 1908, uh, Michigan, maybe? Uh, and Germany in 1915. Keep in mind that Germany was a relatively young nation state in 1915, going from the older medieval format of the empire to being a modern national state, hence the interest in journalism as a way to influence society. And then you find at the beginning of this period the introduction of the instruments of communication, the technologies of communication that we instinctively associate with the media, even though we said it's nothing completely new. It's not something that is only associated with technologies, the idea of communication and influence, or communication of information. But you have at the beginning of this era the introduction of the radio. The radio is, is developed uh, during the first decade of the 20th century. During the 1910s, especially with the war, it is experimented with at the military level as a means of communication. By 1918, most battlefields have radios and units communicate with their headquarters or among each other via, via radio. And then in the 1920s and 30s, the radios appear in everybody's house. People gather, if they don't have a radio, people gather around a, a, a radio box in someone else's apartment or house. And that's the most powerful, most direct way to have the political voice of the leaders reach out the community. TV, of course, is the next wave of technological media. And by this time, it's an explosion of interest. The uh, TV that was introduced as an invention in the 1930s and then became popular in some countries in the 1940s, reached other countries in the 1950s or 60s. At this point, the perception is that media can be so powerful that they need to have even more space within universities, academia, and educational agencies, and therefore you have departments or school of communication. Communication becomes the buzzword during this period. However, at the same time, because of this heightened interest in communication, the paradig paradigm of communication is extended to everything else. So everything can be seen in terms of communication. So 
even when goods travel, even when people travel, it's a form of communication. Even when there is a social transaction of some sort, an exchange between people that involves communication, that is part of the field of the study of communication. And looking back at the past, you have Harold Innes, brilliant scholar, publishing in 1950 this essay, Empire and Communication, saying, well, even the ancient empires, the Roman Empire and other empires in Central and Southern America, Asia, had forms of communication. Because even when you create a network of roads, you are creating a network of communication. So along those roads, contents, information, ideas will travel, right? And then how does it travel and how mobile is information in the past? Well, Innis and others will focus their attention on the material qualities of the content that travel inside a network of communication. So if what you write down is written in stone, which is heavier, then it's not as mobile as something that is on a clay tablet, right? And you can follow the progress of communication going from inscriptions carved in stone to clay tablets, which are much more portable, right? To parchment, which is even lighter, to paper, which is the lightest instrument up until the 1800s, right? When you have the telegraph and therefore communication happens electrically through electricity, through a series of electrical impulse, and therefore it's the lightest and the quickest form. Of course, never to forget that when you have a network of roads, but it could be extended to shipping, along those roads, you also have information that travel and ideas that travel with the people that travel in, in the form of oral communication that is exchanged from one place to another. And, and there is an understanding from the early modern era that this happens. For example, take one of the first modern historian, going back to the idea of Venice being a very advanced modern state. They had one of their patricians, one, a member of the uh, upper echelon of Venetian society, Marin Sanudo, who wrote extensively about the history of his time, left something like 20 or 30 million words of chronicles. And one thing that he did almost daily was to go to the bridge of Rialto, go to Piazza San Marco, to the docks where ships were coming, to talk to the captains of the ships, to learn about news they collected in the places their ship were coming from. And since Venice had a network of commercial relationships with the rest of the world, the news getting to the areas that are now touristic areas could be news from the Middle East, news from Africa, from Spain, from Holland, from England, from Northern Europe, as far as Norway. But when you take the Middle East, those could be news that traveled there from Indonesia, right? And then how do we understand that this is a modern understanding of what information and communications are about. Because after all, just in terms of news that traveled, well, even if you take Herodotus, a, a, a Greek historian from the fifth century or Thucydides, they have some news, historical news about India, for example. That is not very accurate, right? But getting news from distant areas would not by itself be something modern. It becomes modern in the context of Sanudo's operation and Venice during the early 1500s, the early 1500s, is that that information, once circulated, affects market prices. So news about the weather or a political crisis in Indonesia then affects, within days or weeks, the price of goods that come from there, for example, the spices, pepper, nutmeg, other spices, that are being sold in the Venetian market. Because that news 
signifies to those who have the product in their hands that there will be less of a particular product available in the market and therefore they can raise prices. And that is the beginning of globalization, where something immaterial, information about a crop, the production of pepper or nutmeg in Indonesia affects the price of those products in uh, a time that is very quick by the standards of those particular periods, okay? And in terms of ideas that travel, information that travels, keep in mind the modern alternative theories to the theory of the Indo-European population, right? Because you have some linguistic evidence. The linguistic evidence, which is very interesting, which was discovered during the 18th century, is that there are several languages throughout a large uh, uh, territory that goes from northern India to England or Spain. Throughout this entire uh, uh, land that encompasses Central and Southern Europe, Turkey, Iraq and Iran, parts of Pakistan, parts of India, you have a few hundred words that are very similar. And, and it cannot be random. They're words pertaining to members of the family, the tools of agriculture, some of the animals you might be able to find in the farm, some of the foods you might be able to find on the table of a farmer. How do you explain these similarities? The explanation that was introduced at the end of the 18th century was the idea that at some point, uh, around three or 4,000 BC, before the Common Era, uh, in Central Asia, a group of nomadic tribes lived together and they shared a language that was called the Indo-European, which was never consigned to a document because they didn't have writing, a written language. And then, because these nomadic groups, population, tribes, had horses, they domesticated horses around 3,000 years before the Common Era, they start moving around in different directions. And from Central Asia, some moved south into Iran, and then Iraq. Others moved east into Pakistan and India. Others moved west into Greece, Italy, Spain, France, England, etc. What is the alternative theory? There was never such a group such a federation of nomadic tribes. The only reason why we have just a few hundred words that are similar in so many uh, um, areas and ethnic groups is simply because when agriculture was developed, those who were expert professionals who knew the techniques of seeding, of creating a crop, were very much in demand and they moved along the network of roads that existed from India to Western Europe. Alongside this small group of experts in agriculture, the language of their trade traveled and was exported into different areas, which gives you an idea of the development of this idea of a network of communication, which is not immaterial, but it's made also of material realities such as the roads on which information travels. You find then the definition that is given by Burke, because if you write a book, you have to declare what the working definition of media and communication for you would be. And that's why I've quoted it with quotation marks using the exact words of the author, the spread of information, ideas, and forms of entertainment, right? That's very important as well. In words and images, by means of speech, travel, writing, music, print, telegraphy, telephony, radio, television, and most recently, digital, social, mobile, and locative media. Mobile media, of course, you understand it's phones, etc. Locative media, you can click and read the definition and examples in 
uh, Wikipedia would be any kind of media that changes their content based on location. Based on the location and therefore the users that frequent a certain area. When you look at communication in history, even though orality was part of the cultures of previous civilizations, both in the Western and in the non-Western world, there was a lot of attention to the history of past communications after the popularity of radio broadcasts during the 1920s and 30s. Because it was clear at that point that radio had uh, uh, the power to influence the opinions of millions of people in society. It was able to uh, influence their decisions when it came to the elections, etc. We mentioned already World War I and the use that was done by the military, but then both totalitarian regimes such as fascism, Nazism, communism, and democracies, big democracies such as the American democracy relied during this period on radios. This is when you hear the president of the United States, you hear Roosevelt talking to you on the radio, and then Roosevelt, as you know, is re-elected four times, right? It's not by chance, it's not just because then the war came in and they didn't want to change president midway through uh, the war, but it's really the effect of the powerful influence radio had on people. And that's when scholars and also practitioners of journalism create some of the definitions that should be remembered and that are very iconic, very impressive, short definition of the power of the media. So the radio and media in general are a way to manufacture consent, according to Walter Lippmann, right? You listen to content, they're trying to influence your decisions, whether it be political decisions or the decision to buy a product. And Harold Innes, that we mentioned before, then spends a lot of time studying the bias of communication. That is to say, there is no neutral communication, right? Every communication is biased, every journalist, journalist has to have in mind that they have explicit and implicit forms of bias, and they have to be honest and transparent as much as possible with themselves, with their readers, right? And then during the 1960s, you have this Canadian scholar, Marshall McLuhan. Uh, when I went to the university for my PhD, I went to the University of Toronto. Uh, I met Eric McLuhan, the, the son and co-author of, of Marshall. They wrote the Tetrads together in the 19th. 80s, and I was part of the group that created uh, the McLuhan Studies uh, journal uh, because there wasn't such uh, a, a journal, and we used the next computer uh, to uh, do the typesetting of, of the journal. The next computer was uh, a very advanced uh, technology that, that was short lived, an attempt to do a more advanced personal computer. So Marshall McLuhan in the 1960s comes up with the idea of the global village, which entails two notions. Why village? Meaning it means that on a global scale, the entire planet becomes like a village, meaning that distance is annihilated, right? Because you hear instantly the news from all over the world. But why a village? Because according to McLuhan, you then have the same kind of tribalism, the same kind of tribal social patterns that you would find in a very small community. So instead of seeing the world as an organized society which imports information from all over the world and disseminates that information in an organized way, you have emotional reactions, you have impulsive positions taken by the members of the community, even when it is a large community, it behaves like a, a small village. And another famous definition by Marshall McLuhan is the medium is the message, uh, which of course 
was a take on the Marxist view of society, right? Society being defined by the means of production and even culture is just a byproduct of the means of production and the management of those means of production in society. In here is applied to the media, meaning it doesn't matter what the contents are because the biggest changes will, will come from the medium itself, which you can understand in, ter in reference, he was talking about the radio and TV mostly, but then he had other brilliant intuition saying even electricity is a medium. Uh, but you can understand that in reference to smartphones, right? What is the revolution? Is, is what you read on the screen or the fact that you have this smartphone with you? Of course, the function of the smartphone is secondary to the impact that the declared function of the smartphone is secondary to the impact that the smartphones have on society. In reference to electricity, well, electricity by itself is conducive to a series of changes. With electricity, you have lights, right? You have a system to illuminate interior spaces, external spaces, and that affect, will affect, for example, the sleep patterns. People spend the night in different ways uh, in the past. We know, for example, that they, they, they had two periods of sleep during the night that people would spend, when darkness came, a few hours sleeping, then they would wake up, use, of course, lamps and other forms of primitive illumination, spend some time reading, writing, etc., and then go back to sleep again. And, and then we have this idea, of, instead of modern cycles of sleep, which should be uninterrupted, and if it is not, you should be troubled by this, and your, your body will, will suffer, etc. But it, it is an idea, it's not biology. With electricity, as we said before, you have the invention of the telegraphs, because electrical impulses communicate the Morse code, and it means that space is reduced. The time it takes for any information to travel through the telegraph is affected. But McLuhan wrote the Gutenberg Galaxy in 1961 or 62, where he talks about the typographic man, meaning that man who had books around had a different mindset altogether. The, the book itself, before any content was accessed in those books, changed the way they saw reality. And what does it mean for McLuhan? It means that looking at the format of the book as a medium and saying, well, the book is based on what? It's based on linearity, right? Beginning to end, each line, each sentence has a beginning, a middle, and an end. But is linearity the natural state of information? No, of course not. Information is chaotic. Information is fragmented, is present in different forms of aggregation. It's very fluid, right? However, in order to produce a book, you have to segment the information. You have to reorganize it. You have to make it systematic, and then you can put it in a book. And that affects the way you use this model anywhere else. It becomes a mindset, right? You see chaos, you see entropy, oh, that's terrible, I have to organize it. Is it natural? No, it's cultural, right? Entropy is nature. Organization is human, right? And of course, it's easy to think of the rest that McLuhan uh, extracted from this line of thinking Print is permanent, orality is fluid, right? Every time you tell a story, you tell it in a different ways. And you even have experts at this university, such as Nancy Franklin, uh, studying how eyewitnesses are famously unreliable because every time they're interrogated, they'll either change slightly their report of the event or every time some fake elements will be solidified and the memory will become memory of the story, not memory of the event, right? You, you swear you remember something just because you remember telling the story that way, not because you remember the event itself. 
And, and then of course, if you control literacy, then you control the way things are read, things are interpreted. And of course, it's never literacy, it's always a, a multiple uh, areas of expertise. But at the same time, this man that was reshaped, this individual, uh, reshaped by the invention of Gutenberg, the invention of the printing press, doesn't eliminate orality, right? Because you read a book and then you tell about what you read. And especially for the first 300 centuries, with alphabetization being limited, you have only a small minority of people in most society, no more than 10 or 15% who read books or magazines, and then they read to others or they tell stories to others, and those others will relate the story to others, so it's secondary and tertiary orality also. So the two systems coexist, right? Habermas is worth mentioning. You just find a paragraph or two in the book. The idea that we now think of society as the public sphere and discourse would be the tropes, the organizations of the language, the formal uh, ways to aggregate words and the intellectual ways to connect those words and how they influence the way we think about society, about events, about ideas. Okay, so if you control the discourse, you control the, the effects. If you introduce certain words, then those words have powerful effects. Hilary? Yeah, I just have a question. So like the secondary orality you say, like is, is the Bible like, for example, like uh, some historic things, is it like form based on that? Like, well, a lot of ancient texts are the byproducts of oral transmission. So uh, Burke will mention not the example of the Bible, I think, I don't think he includes the example of the Bible, but he, for sure he mentions the Iliad and the Odyssey, the, the po poems like Homer, uh, these Greek poems that tell of the siege of Troy and then the stories of Ulysses one or Odysseus, one of the heroes who was responsible for the fall of Troy through the Trojan horse and who spent 10 years traveling through the Mediterranean before he came home to his uh, native uh, island. Uh, so we know that those poems which established are practically the foundation of Western literature for hundreds of years were told orally, were repeated by poets who memorized those stories, and then they were written down between the year 800 and the year 700 uh, BC or BCE. The same is true for the Bible, even the Bible, and within the Bible, even the New Testament, the Gospels existed in an oral format, was entrusted to people who would tell those stories and those stories were appropriated orally by various communities and reshaped in different ways. And then if you take the gospels, they were probably written only 50 to 100 years after the events purported to be described in the gospels, the death of Jesus under Pontius Pilate, dating around 30 of the, the year 30 of the common era. But at best, the first gospels we're, uh, we're putting right in towards the end of the first century, if, if not in fact at the beginning of the second century, following a chain of orality where allegedly eyewitnesses told the stories and then those who were the stories told them to the next generation until someone put it in writing when the size of the Christian communities were such and their dispersion geographically was such that they felt it necessary to put it in writing to avoid excessive fragmentation and multiplication of those stories. So they needed to have something to confront, to compare each other's opinion of what Jesus has said or what Christian religion was about. So orality has existed before literature. Secondary orality is orality that stems from a written text. And therefore, it's not a story that was first told 
by someone to someone else and then put in writing. But it's a story that's being read by someone, either to themselves or read loud to a group. And then members of those groups, the listeners, turn into story, oral storytellers. That's secondary orality. Uh, yes? Well, yeah, I have a question. So you explain about the culture and natural concept. I think that's very interesting. So do you think the opposite concept of nature is culture? Nature is culture? Or no, you, no? you said um, culture, is, culture is basically made by people, right? Right. And the nature is made it by itself. So do you think that's the opposite concept to each other? Well, do we have nature without culture? Right, it's, it's the classical conundrum, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to hear it, does it make a sound? That is to say, we cannot experience nature without observing nature, and therefore the moment we observe nature, we apply culture to our observation. So whenever we say we create an opposition between nature and culture, it is also a, 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 a rhetorical, uh, um, dilemma right because in this dilemma nature is the result of how we objectify it and how we interpret it we cannot say it's out there and then i compare myself because what i'm comparing myself to is in itself the result of my constructions of my analysis of my uh, observation okay so there is no clear answer to your question because whenever I or anyone else talks about nature, there is no objective representation of nature, or even if you uh, um, presume uh, scientific observation of nature is, is neutral, even science is, is not entirely neutral, even science is limited to a subset of natural phenomena, right? Uh, empirical phenomena, etc. So one way or the other. Sorry? No. Thank you. I thought I heard someone. Okay. I'll continue. So when when you uh, examine so the, the, the focus of this first part and almost running out of time, the, the one one of the themes of this first part of my lecture on the introduction and the introduction itself in the book is that the media are new when you only associate them to technology, but there are many elements in the media that are very old. And further confirmation of that is that when scholars of the media have examined the TV serials, well, the TV serials that were a very successful format in TV from the 1960s and 70s, follow the same template of radio serials, where you had installments of the same story on the radio that you were following, tuning in to follow every day or every week, etc., on a regular basis. And in terms, though, the elements that made those serialized stories successful can already be found in the serialized stories printed in the magazines or the newspapers during the 19th century, where they would, most of the big bestsellers of the past, take Jules Verne or uh, other uh, famous novels, first appeared in installments. Take Pinocchio, for example. Even Pinocchio first appeared in installments in magazines. And then it was republished as a book. Okay, so there are the same element of suspense, of keeping the story going, of cliffhangers, etc. But that's not even enough, right? Because even if you go back farther in time, you find that, and McLuhan has an entire book about this, that even paintings and fresco in the churches made the church a broadcasting medium, right? Because you enter a church now to admire the arts, but people in the past were influenced by the images that they saw. And the priests of the past during their homilies would refer to the paintings or the frescoes and would say, Consider this, consider this saying, consider this episode in the life of Jesus, etc. And I have some examples, but I'll show them to you later. So I'll stop 
here, 